ease. Okay. I'll call a uh, <coughs> meeting of the Board of Commissioners in Carroll County for September 15th, 2016. First item, pledge allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We have a motion to approve the minutes of September 7th. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes of September 7th. Second. Any further discussion? All those in support of the motion say aye. 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 So voted. Registry of deeds bid. Oh, public input. I'm sorry. Nothing? Okay. Bid for Lisa for registry of deeds. We put out to bid uh, for deed binders in August, end of August. Um, received two responses. They were due in this week on Tuesday. And I think that you have a packet that shows you what the responses are. Right. Uh, I recommend we take the um, COT systems proposal for 100 binders. Who did this before? Did they do it before? Co-file did it before, and Co-file met their price of last year if we were to purchase 100. Um, I've seen the cut binders, they're the same. I had, um, I borrowed some from Cheshire County, which uses the ones from Cot. Yeah. Um, the only difference between the Cheshire ones and the ones that I would order would be that they would have a, a, a metal spine. <coughs> Better price, same quality. That's the What's price. the difference between 80 and 100? Why did you bring it out for 80 versus 100? Price break, you, the more you order, the better the price. But do we get. need 100 or do we need 80? It, we need somewhere between 60 and 80 a year. Depends on the economy. So they won't go back. You know, they're going to be printed with the book number. They're going to be printed with Carroll County records. Um, and it will mean, if we get 100, that we won't order them quite as soon next time we order. Last year we ordered 80. We have uh, enough left for a month, month and a half. And how was it advertised? As it was written in the letter, which was approved in August on the 24th, it was submitted, um, advertised, by email to three different outfits that I know by them. Uh, it was also put on our website. Okay. Questions? Yeah. In my business experience, whenever you get such a diversion of uh, uh, price and a discrepancy in pricing, there's something always different. They want our business. And we're talking, we're talking, we're, we're talking um, 15, what, 15, 20 percent difference just, just in, on, on uh, 7,800 bucks. We got a, we got a thousand dollar difference here, 900 dollar difference. Are you sure they're the same? I am. <clears throat> I've seen them in hand. I did make sure of that. Um, I believe that COT Systems would like our business. They have um, their foot in the door in the western part of the state. And they're from Ohio? Or? They're from... Ohio, Columbus, Ohio. Yeah. And you've seen both of them? I have. We, they were one of the outfits that bid last year as well. They did not uh, succeed with the bid last year. They were much more money last year. <coughs> I'm sorry, I didn't hear your question. What was your question? I have pictures of them if you'd like to see. If, if you've seen them, I've seen them. Oh, yes, I've seen them in here. I had um, Anna Tilton of of uh, Cheshire uh, have 
delivered to me one so that I could check it out. The difference is that the ones that uh, she has, this part is not metal, it's plastic, but what we've always had is metal and they will get us the metal version. Okay, and the metal one is, is, is in this part? Yes, I did not even get a quote on it. I got a quote, but I'm not submitting it as an offer. Okay. I, don't, I don't think the plastic is something that I want for the archive record. I'll make a motion we accept the, uh, the bid for uh, uh, bindery and preservation of the records for the registry of deeds. And then it goes to Cot Systems of Columbus, Ohio for, um, it's going to be the 100, right, Lisa? We have it in the Six, budget. 69, uh, 69, uh, 6925 dollars and um, it will it'll meet uh, all the specifications that were in the uh, in the bid. Second. 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 Any further discussion? All those in support of the motion say aye. 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 So voted. Thank you. Would you sign the um paper that you have there? Or would you like me to sign it? I'll sign it. That whole package? <coughs> um, I'll send I it have it, sure. Okay. Oh, okay. You can have Mr. Chairman, um, starting today, our uh, new jail programs are going to be starting. Uh, so I thought Ian Phillips would come over and uh, get you updated on, on where we are, and we're ready to roll that out today. So, okay. Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> Good morning. Uh, so, uh, as you're aware, over the last several months with the uh, the the kind of the contracting with Kevin Warwick and his uh, mm -hmm. his consulting firm, uh, we've developed a transition from jail to community program. Uh, we have put a program, uh, a, a core class uh, schedule together, and we're beginning it on Monday. Um, we're, we're very excited. Uh, we've been in contact with most of the area prosecutors, our county attorney's office, and the public defender's office, and we're getting a tremendous amount of support in terms of uh, how we're going to structure the, the sentencing language so that people are seen through the court system, can, can be better filtered and directed towards the program that we have to offer. And the purpose of the program? The purpose of the program is to reduce recidivism. <laughs> okay. Keep people out of jail. Not just get them out of jail, but keep them out of jail. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, there's there's four four core programs. Uh, one is the Thinking for a Change that's been incredibly successful um, just over the last three and three and a half years here. Uh, we've added to that um, a class called Living in Balance, which is a substance abuse uh, educational class. It really covers the effects of, of uh, addiction on the body and uh, a lot of the triggers and things that uh, perpetuate that cycle of substance misuse. In addition to that, we've added an anger management, which is just a good fundamental course for anyone to participate in. Uh, and finally, uh, a program called Seeking Safety, which addresses trauma and substance misuse. Uh, most people that have uh, substance misuse and abuse and addiction issues suffer from some level of trauma in their lives and they've turned to drugs and alcohol as a means of managing those uh, those emotions that coincide with the trauma so uh, there's uh, there's some <coughs> secondary courses um, 
employment readiness, which deals with just some basic skills of completing job applications, how to interview, follow-ups, uh, parenting courses. So there's some secondary support things like that that will occur for the participants. And then the case management is the biggest piece, and it's making sure that people are ready when they leave. That they have appointments in place within the first 48 hours of, of discharge. They have a place to go. They have people to connect to right away. We're very excited. Have we hired any new people? Or? The jail has brought on a full-time um, mental health, uh, licensed mental health clinician, who's also a LADAC. And we've hired on a full-time case manager. Right. And will they be the ones teaching these new courses? They will be teaching the courses. I will still be teaching, uh, thinking for a change, and overseeing their work in addition to uh, my other duties. So two of those that you mentioned out of the four we're already doing, right? Thinking for a change and anger management? Yes. Yes. And parenting? Parenting, we we've, we've gotten, uh, we've done on and off over the years, uh, as, as needed, as demanded. Uh, University of New Hampshire uh, Cooperative Extension has been outstanding in mm -hmm. providing that service to us. And they're not doing that any longer? The, uh, it, was, it was offered by Ann Hamilton out of the Conway mm -hmm. uh, office, and they took that away from her, is my understanding, for lack of a better term. And it was shuffled over to a gentleman uh, near Franklin. Area. Oh, right. That's right. I heard it. Um, luckily, uh, Jim Stoddard is the, our full-time mental health clinician. He has the experience providing uh, parenting skills and, and co-parenting skills. And so he can provide that, that course. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, <clears throat> just for the record, Ian, it wasn't taken away from her when the legislature cut the cut the university budget by 45% and, and, and the cooperative extension was forced to, to make some drastic changes, they, they reorganized the whole thing. Ann is now the, the food safety person for the, basically for the state of New Hampshire. It's a much more eloquent way of saying it. Yeah, what I like. The other thing, and then they had the gentleman from Stratford or Cheshire, the way that you're talking about coming in, I think they've uh, I think they've switched. He, there's another new person that's going to take his place. I'm not sure. And we'll we'll make sure to make contact with the the cooperative extension and utilize that service as much as possible. Um, in addition to uh, the communication we've had with the the area prosecutors and the courts. We've also been in contact with the uh, Rockingham County Attorney's Office, as we're currently contracted to house Rockingham females. Um, they're excited to have this program as a sentencing option for their female prisoners. And um, I've recently been in contact with the Chief of Federal Probation out of Concord, and where we are contracted to hold federal prisoners, uh, they now have a sentencing option for federal probationers that have violations to send them into a program. So it's our hope that we'll, we'll, see, uh, we'll see participants from those arenas as well. How many other counties have these programs? I would s uh, Sullivan has been running a, a very similar program with great success for, I think, six years now. And Kevin Warwick started that one? And Kevin Warwick, yes, he started that one. Uh, Merrimack County is working with Kevin Warwick right now to develop a similar program. They've been running for about a year. Uh, I'm not sure where they're at in the process. A much bigger facility, very different dynamics for Merrimack County. Stratford County has been running a, a, a treatment option in their jail that they refer to as their therapeutic community, uh, which is well respected. Uh, Rockingham uh, is, uh, has been running um, uh, an, an in-house treatment, and I think they're getting ready to, uh, to maybe even make some changes and, and bring it up a little bit. So it's, it's, becoming, it's becoming the standard in the state. When an inmate completes these four areas, how do they get recognized? 
Do they get a certificate or? Yes. Or? Yeah, there's absolute certificates of completion. Yeah. On each one of them or total? No, for the whole for the whole program. Mm -hmm. It's uh, the components all being evidence-based practices, one really supports the other. Um, and it's, there's a lot of repetition of the message um, for, the, for the skills building that occurs in each of the classes. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a totality of the, of the courses offered in the programs. Can you tell me a little bit more about the Living in Balance, that second? Living in Balance was developed by Hazleton Publications. It's a the the total course is 36 sessions, um, and we're gonna we're gonna utilize some of the some of the later portions, but the first 12 sessions of the curriculum are uh, what's referred to as psychoeducational uh, that just deal with substance abuse and addiction. Uh, it talks about uh, how certain certain drugs affect the body and the mind in certain ways. Uh, it educates them on how uh, tolerances are actually developed. You, you learn a lot about what happens physically and emotionally um, when you're using and misusing substances to an excess. You mentioned so many weeks. How many weeks does it take to complete all four? 90 days. 90 days. 90 days, so roughly 12 weeks. 12 weeks and how many hours a day? Uh, four to five hours a day. All They'll during the programming. Yeah. All during the day. Yeah. Any night? Any evening sessions? We are bringing in uh, a program called Smart Recovery uh, to be conducted in the evenings, and that's an open an open forum uh, that all inmates can attend. They don't have, it doesn't have to be strictly adhered, uh, mm -hmm. it's not strictly for the people that are enrolled in the program. And Smart Recovery uh, works off of evidence-based practices all, also, and it supports the message of the, the programming that's already in place. Um, this will, the Smart Recovery program will take the place of 12-step meetings like AA or NA. It's uh, it's more it's more consistent information, um, and again, it supports our our core programming in terms of evidence-based practice. So, what happens if you get thirty inmates that want to take this at one time? I mean, you can't have that whole the whole housing unit over there in one room at one time. We that can. Is, we actually have the space for it, and, and we can accommodate that. That's not a security issue. That's what our staff does. They're they're exceptional at supervising inmates. Okay. What's a, what is the process for an inmate to participate? They're not forced to. It's volunteer. We are we are uh, developing the the sentencing language uh, in conjunction with the, the courts and the prosecutors and the defense counsel, and uh, it's it's not finalized at this time. But the gist of it is that the sentence would be a recommendation for assessment and placement into the program. Mm -hmm. um, with a recommendation from the court, we could do an assessment. There may be some people uh, that would be inappropriate uh, for the program. Um, and there's some people that may not be assessed at a high risk level. And we're really going after the high risk people. Mm -hmm. The people we continue to see over and over, the higher recidivism rates. So the assessment is done, the assessment would be done within the first 10 to 14 days. Um, and that's an assessment done through the Ohio Risk Assessment System, or ORAS. And that allows, uh, that's, that's a system that's been developed by the National Institute of Corrections in conjunction with the University of Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, it's, it's also an evidence-based and validated assessment tool. And that determines risk levels across a number of areas in terms of criminal history, criminal thinking, uh, peer support, uh, financial and educational barriers. And it helps us identify where someone has a weak area and where they also have strong areas. 
We want to emphasize where they have good strengths. Is there a pass or fail system? It's it's meaningful participation. Um, so there's no testing or anything. No, no. It's and and it's a very the what an individual draws out of it uh, is very unique to them and their circumstances. Uh, people come from a lot of different backgrounds with substance misuse, uh, and they've they've got to find the thing that they connect to, the thing that resonates for them. And everyone, the skills are the same, and how someone interprets it is a very unique situation. And that's the, the beauty of having a, a, a licensed clinician on staff, is they can really identify and help guide people into an area where they're going to absorb the information that's most effective for them. Okay. Um, we've hired a case manager, as, and we've, you brought her in and introduced her. Um, what can the taxpayers expect um, from a caseworker? What What is she going to do? Uh, what are we looking for for results? Um, accountability. The case manager is going to bring the, the accountability into play. Um, okay, <coughs> accountability. It's, it's, the, the tracking of the inmates, the effectiveness of the program, the recidivism rates. Um, one of her major functions is going to be developing a case management plan which identifies those risk areas and connects them to the services they need when they leave. The research shows that inmates are reverting back to criminal behavior within the first 72 hours of discharge. If that's happening within the first 72 hours, you don't have a good program. That's, that's a problem. Um, our program is including a year of aftercare, um, which is our ability to follow up in the, with these inmates after they leave us in the community, to offer them support, to track their progress, help them stay on, on track with their goals. So, Ian, what happens in the case where you, well, we've had a rent-a-convict from the state prison and they get released, who, who now tracks them? The state parole board or us? State or parole and probation will follow them. We will also have a case management plan to hand over to state parole and probation. And we'll also be able to do that with our local inmates that also go to state parole and probation. We're going to be able to work in conjunction with them and show them what we have set up for the offender. It, it went in, the, in this, in the, what, where we're going with this case management, is there any contact with the ex-inmate and the case manager after they get out? Yes. Within a year. Yes. She, she works, uh, I assume, from 8 to 4, so we can't expect her to be on the phone and she has her home life and calling up these people at, at 8 o'clock to find out what's going on, but that's what's really needed because you can't call them at work. How do you contact them? The aftercare would include an aftercare group, and it re would require, we believe, uh, this is Superintendent Henry committed to providing this aftercare, um, and that we're going to provide these aftercare groups. We're going to have, at, at least to begin with, weekly connections with the offenders after they're released, to be able to follow up with them, see if they're making their appointments, and... Uh, and redirect them if they're having some troubles. Does the case manager help them find a job? Yes. And this person, Christian Babs, is assuming it's a female. It is. It is a female. Yes. Okay. Um, would she have a, she would most likely have a list of places that are looking for uh, people to work? She will. Uh, she also has connections with New Hampshire Employment Security and some various work programs conducted through Department of Health and Human Services. So it's a, it's building a complete network. Do you find that an inmate has a problem getting a job because they've been incarcerated? They can. Um, I've run into some barriers um, when I was first trying to, when I was just kind of the only game in town at the jail. Uh, trying to connect people to, to like jobs. I can remember bringing inmates into various businesses. 
and just being told, no, we don't hire them. Them. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, the job market right now is very good. Most businesses are looking for good employees, mm -hmm. and that's opened more doors. When the economy was uh, slightly different four years ago, um, five years ago, it was, uh, it was not as easy to get uh, an offender leaving the jail into a work option. Well, you know, I would assume a certificate of completion would help get that person in. It absolutely will. But Ian, in my limited experience and with your experience, um, they, they, these people almost need to have somebody that isn't and it hasn't been incarcerated to, and in a position that, that, I don't know what you want to call it, leadership or respect or something, that, that will speak for these kids. You look at our, our favorite one up there in Glen. I mean, you're going to go, got a degree in culinary arts, going to get out of college, going to go to work the minute he gets out of here. You know, it was six months later before someone got him a job and he went from there. But um, we need, you know, to have the community willing to accept these people. You don't want to put a bank robber in a in front of the in a bank, in a, in a <laughs> bank or, a, or a petty thief in front of the cash register, but we need to find people that'll, that'll hire them. And to me, the lawn business or something like that is a perfect There's perfect barriers. Fit. There are some definite barriers. Uh, as, as much as I'm able to, I'll uh, come to speak to the commissioners uh, being, being recorded for, for the community to see. Uh, it gives me an opportunity to start educating people. These offenders are all coming back to the community, whether whether yeah, we one provide, time or another. Whether we provide the programs or not, whether we try and offer them uh, an alternative to, to the way they've been living, we're going to send them back better than when they arrived to us. And and the community is going to be better for it in the whole. And the 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 employers of the community are going to have a better candidate pool to draw from. They're going to have more consistent people that have good, strong social skills to function in a job market and to be a productive member of the community. That's why I think it's important that we keep, one of the reasons we keep the farm open, because these characters know they've got to go to work at 8 o'clock every day, and they're going to work until 4 or 3.30. And some, and maybe the maybe they're not going to go somewhere and throw hay the rest of their life, but they're going to learn their work ethics, ethics. work ethic, and uh, and you, I don't know how you put a price on that. On uh, TV on uh, the NPR program last night, I believe, where they had uh, inmates being able to take. Uh, college courses through their facility. Um, I don't know if the government had cut that program off. I didn't understand that situation, but um, it was a new program, and, and people who had been in there were taking these these classes and getting something towards a degree. You know anything about that? The jail offers. We have. Uh we have a wonderful lady uh, named Muriel Farah that comes in and does high set uh, at the jail. I don't know if you're familiar. The GED in New Hampshire has been elevated to the standard called high set, which is high school equivalency test now. Um, and she's our high set instructor, and she does some college prep uh, with offenders when they when they show the potential for um, that they have the aptitude to to work at that level. Uh, our most recent uh, graduate of high set uh, actually uh, scored at the college readiness level on her high set degree. And if she wants, to, she's since been released. But if she wanted to enroll herself in college, she she's functioning at the level that she could handle those those classes. Is she a run an inmate, or she was one of our own? 
She was one of ours. And do we do anything to encourage you to go to college? Yes. There are some, there are some financial aid barriers that I'm aware of. Um, the federal government has uh, some, some restrictions on people applying for federal student aid that have convictions for uh, sales and or distribution of narcotics. I don't know that that was the case with her, but I wanted to make that known to the, to the board. Commissioner, do you have any? Well, I was just going to comment that I think, as you mentioned, that, you know, all these offenders are going to return to the community. And certainly, you know, uh, finding a place to live, you know, is important. But, you know, it's also part of the community's uh, responsibility to accept them back once they are released with proper training and, you know, getting, having a job to be able to earn money, to be able to pay your rent, you know, is, is certainly an important component. So hopefully that those barriers with more communication will be brought down. And I'm, I'm sure there's employers right now that are interested in trying to find ways of finding the right people to come. I have a, a couple of local businesses that, that contact me on a regular basis looking to see if I have anyone that's eligible for work release and they, they would love to have them in. And we've, had, we've actually had uh, good success in the past placing them at these two respective companies. But you know as well as I do, Ian, that the jobs they get are I'm not going to say not meaningful, but there are menial tasks, and, and and there isn't much opportunity for these kids to move up in in in, in these jobs. And we we need to find something that, if they do a good job, that there's there's some place to improve there. I agree with that. I think offenders have to they should identify. Part of the case management is is to identifying their goals. And, and outline those goals in a very tangible manner, um, making them specific and realistic and attainable. And these, these offenders have to have aspirations. And maybe they can see the job they're going to get into is not the job they have to keep, but as a stepping stone. And those social skills come into play when they can develop the, the patience to say, okay, I know I need to be here for another three months, six months, and during that time I'll be working towards, you know, uh, what my what my desired place is, and that's that that period of aftercare is working with them and keeping them on track. Well, I, I, from my experience, as limited as it is, it's one it's something that's really needed. We have an, a young man that we we excused from the facility here, what, six months ago? It took me two hours to track him down. He was on his third job. And nobody wanted to talk about it. Nobody wanted to say why he left or what he did or if he even doing a good job. And I called him a couple of times and asked him to call me back and he hasn't called back. So, you know, he, he's He's out there, he hasn't come back here, but nobody knows what he's doing. And we should be keeping on top of a kid like this for a year or two. And that is, that is the perfect argument for the aftercare portion of the program. That, that constant contact, that weekly contact, the follow-up, and the releases of information in place to be able to speak to everyone he's connected with the community, from his employer to uh, you know, state services, to make sure that he's on his track. Anything else? I don't know. Okay. Um, you have anything else? No. no thank you, Ian. Ian, you uh, certainly understand the program. I'm sure you've been working with Kevin while we're on it. Um, you've done an excellent job in the past trying to help our inmates and. Uh, I certainly appreciate all the work that you've done. I'm sure the full board does. Um, you've, been, you've done some outstanding work, and hopefully it's paid off with 
with our people that are visiting our facility. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like me to stay for one more thing. Okay. Um, I, I'd like to digress a little bit uh, from the agenda. <clears throat> Yesterday we had uh, a meeting with, with the clerk of the court, so over at the Superior Court, mm -hmm. with uh, the felonies first. Uh, it's going to be implemented on the 9th of January. In talking with, with her, um, some things are going to be really different. And one of those things, uh, there's going to be a, an increase in the county attorney's office. Uh, they're guessing about 50 cases uh, extra a month. So, um, a month? A month? Yeah. yeah. Um, right? She said a month, right? I believe that's yeah. correct. Um, Excuse me, Kenny, is that 50 cases? Is that, are we talking about Carroll County or are we just taking an average of 50 cases a month across the state? Carroll County. Carroll because County. Because what's going to happen is the county attorney is going to be in at the beginning. Right now, uh, the local PDs would uh, set the charge for the, uh, for the arrestee. Uh, now it's going to be done by the county attorney's office, um, and right. Correct me if I'm wrong. The the process now is that all all arrests uh, start at the district court level, um, and if there's probable cause that it's uh, can be tried as a felony case, then it's bound over to superior court. This will kind of remove the probable cause phase and the and the, the binding over process, and uh, start it off with the county attorney's office to determine whether a case can be tried as a felony, and it will start at the superior court level in that case. That's my understanding. So it it's just to speed things up. It's, it's supposed yes. to. Yes. Yeah. Um, and I was I was a little perplexed yesterday when they said that there'll be no video arraignments. The, they want to see the inmate in person. Um, and I think that's because there's not a monitor over there. My, yeah, I got the impression. The Superior Court doesn't have uh, video capabilities currently. Oh, only District Court downstairs does. So, and they, so they would need to share it. So we'd have to set up some times or get another monitor and, and, and supply them with that. You know, um, this is over there, not yeah, here. Right. Well, why should we? we? Why doesn't the Department well, we of Justice? Yeah. You know, and when we when they built the place, they had it wired so that they could do this. Mm -hmm. thing. Why don't they spend the money? Well, I mean, we would save the money by not transporting them, so so the sheriff's office wouldn't have that that it's, extra it's, expense. <clears throat> I mean, the the monitor would. You're, you're probably would right, Ken, but you know, the the state runs on the cheap day in and day out. So um, and so is the county, and and it's the it's the Department of Justice responsibility to put that in, not the taxpayers in Carroll County, whether they're saving money or not. And maybe it's maybe it's foolish for us to take a hard stand, but if someone doesn't dig their heels in, nothing will ever get done. It'll continue the way it's going for it's gone for the last two hundred years. Or, um. So as a result of this, we're going to have to hire an additional attorney? Yes. I don't know. <clears throat> um, I had a quick conversation with, with Michaela yesterday, um, and, and, may, and, and also I was talking to the, the clerk yesterday, and maybe that would be a good job for the county attorney to do it themselves, you know, is to take on those cases. Um, but, but I don't know. They're having a meeting next Wednesday, the 22nd. Is that Wednesday? Uh, Thursday, I believe. Next Thursday, um, at court for you know all the police departments and uh, Ian's going uh, to represent the jail. Uh, you know to learn more information. When does this take effect? January 9th. January. Um, it's already being done in Belknap, is that correct? Belknap and Stratford and Hillsborough. 
or Merrimack, one of the two big counties. So, um, so you know, we need to get more, you know, some more information. Uh, and that's that. So I, I just wanted to update on that real quick. Well, it sounds like we could use Veltnap maybe as a resource for the, you know, finding out the transition and what they found within their office as far as the additional workload. And I know Michaela has been talking to them and also talking to um, uh, Judge Nato. Uh, she's had some meetings with her about how to implement <coughs> these spurs. So I think she's, you know, she's up on the implementation of felonies first. I just wasn't uh, aware that some of these changes w were happening. Um, Does this come under a 28A um, situation where we're basically being mandated to, to hire another person? No, I mean, uh, if, if, if they can do it within the office. Well, then it's not, but if they can. I don't know. Maybe they need a part-time person. Well, the, the 28A says the state cannot force you to do something without paying for it. Are they going to give us more money if we have to hire somebody? I don't think so. Well, it might be to our benefit if, uh, if the system can speed up and so that we don't have to pay for the inmate in our facility. Right. So, I guess there's some pros and cons as to whether we hire them or not. Do you need to add to any of that? Uh, it's, a, it's great to, to see the, the option of doing video arrangements. Mm -hmm. uh, it does put, uh, it does tax uh, the jail staff in terms of it requires an officer to be posted uh, with the offender during those video arraignments for right. as long as that goes on. Um, in essence, my perspective is we, we kind of take on the role as a, of a court security officer in that, in that setting, um, which is not our function and, and does take away from our day-to-day our -day operations. Go ahead. Um, two questions, Ian. Um, number one, do... Do we do video arraignments with other with other uh, um, courts? Yes, we do. Okay, that answer that. Um, when you have a video uh, <coughs> arraignment, how does it work? Do you set up a time? Ten o'clock. You're going to have uh, uh, the court likes candidate X to come for an arraignment. Yes, so the, the court sets the time. Is there, is there, what I'm really getting at, is it like over here where you could go over at 10 o'clock and sit there for two hours before you get into the court? <laughs> or is if they tell you 10 o'clock, is it 10 uh, o'clock? That, has, that yeah. has happened. There's There's been time set and then the court was not ready to start at that time. So we would have a, an officer tied up that, or could you keep the, you, well, why couldn't you keep the person in his cell until... The, arraignment. the video system is controlled by the state court, um, okay. and they dial in, and uh, we've made uh, all reasonable accommodations to be ready when when they've been ready to start, and that has that has kept our staff in a holding pattern from time to time. So, where is the camera? Uh, in the jail. We have a we have a video station yeah. uh, just out just in our booking area. Uh, There's a small room off to the side mm -hmm. of our booking area. Okay. Where we do that. Well, isn't there an officer down there, anyways? Yes. And uh, from time to time, that officer's duties take them out of that booking okay. area. Okay. So I guess. Uh, I mean, there's we need a way. You know, it sounds to me like we either are transporting them there and then the jail's officers have less duties or, or they're transporting there and the sheriff's office is having more duties. So it's really, you know, it's a really a matter of what saves the most money overall because they're both county functions. And, and what's the more secure? Correct. 
So in the jail it is the most secure area. Yeah. That way there's no attempt to escape or, or there something is, may happen. If I may, there is one more component is that uh, the people being arraigned are entitled to legal representation and the public defender's office or whoever is assigned to, to be that representation for the arraignment needs access to the offender mm -hmm. before the hearing. And sometimes that's done telephonically, sometimes the, the attorney's arriving in person and we set them up to, to meet with the, the offender prior to the arraignment. Um, and the Laconia Public Defender's Office serves Carroll County. They don't have someone in the area. And that, that is a potential problem in terms of access as felonies first moves forward. Why? The availability of the public defender. As I understand, Carroll County is the only county in the state that doesn't have a public defender's office within the county. We've been. Is that a state function to, to put one here? Or the public is defender's a, office is a, is a state entity, yeah. Okay. Yep. All set? Great, right, thank you. Anything else? No. And we'll see you in a little while. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Now, that went a little longer than I thought, so. Um, yeah. Sometimes the investment is kind of worth it. Yeah. Uh, could we go to the, uh, to the farm committee? Sure. In your packet, <clears throat> there's an email from uh, uh, Steve Knox, and I spoke with him yesterday. And, And at great length, he he's he's been getting a lot of a lot of contacts and are from around the state, and he's found one over near Lebanon. It's a woman who uh, her, her name is Rose Wilson, um, and she she does uh, what we want over that over in that area, and she would like to get involved with the Carroll County Farm. Um, and she would do the feasibility study, and also she would run the um, the listening sessions. Uh, she would do the farmer survey. Um, so uh, and she would help do the R, you know, help build the RFP. Um, so Steve would like her to come to the next meeting. Um, and so, you know, to cover her time and, and, you know, and her travel costs, she's asking for around a couple hundred dollars just to cover, you know, time and, and travel time over here and mileage and gas. Um, so he asked me yesterday what, if we could find a couple hundred dollars. What's said, your background in order to do this? Do we know? Yeah, uh, he does. Um, she she uh, does um, these types of studies. Uh, she also mentioned that the Lakes Region was doing a study covering the same ground that we want to cover. You know, as far as you know, what can they do with some of their farmland? Uh, and so he's going to contact them as well. But um, he said that that you know she, she this is what she does over there. You know. Land studies. Uh, um, she's met with farmer groups over there. Um, so it's something that uh, he would like to have her come over and talk to the group uh, to help us move further along. Well, basically, if she's coming over here and it's going to be a a job interview. No, it's See, not a job interview. I know it isn't, but if it, that's is she, is she going to come over here and 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 talk about the survey, or is she going to come and tell tell us what or tell him or you know, the committee what she's done, what her experience is, and and she'd like to be the one to. Uh, he already knows all that. No, she wants to come over and 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 help us formulate the farm survey. Okay. Help us, you know. Um, schedule some listening sessions and what's really involved in that, you know? How do we run a listening session? Um, and uh, uh, she's been involved with the town of Bosco and uh, 
and they're doing an agricultural study over there. Is there any help from these other two um, uh, funding? Peter Benson and uh, yeah. uh, Andy Kendall? Yeah. Um, they, they said that they would be interested in doing, in helping fund, uh, you know, the feasibility study. Mm -hmm. um, well, this is part of it, right? Yeah. Has he contacted them to see yes. if they would pick it up? Yes. But yeah, I, he has not communicated to me that that they have that they've secured funding for the the, the three hundred dollars or the two fifty. But I know he did ask them through an email. Well, as the administrator, do we have any money any place that yes. could be used? Yes. I don't understand this. She's happy to come to a September 22nd meeting, but since she has not been hired, uh, hired by who? Us? Or mm -hmm. by Us. Well, you, you guys, not me. Hired by the Board of Commissioners to help with the RFP. So not only is she going to want mileage and time, but she's most likely going to be the consultant if she writes up the RFP and then we would have to hire her or whoever, whoever, or whoever, whoever is the, you know, she'll, she'll do the RFP for the yeah. feasibility study. She okay. may not get it. Okay. Um, but, as a, but as we know now, there's, there are two people, Rose Wilkins and Kathy, um, yes. the one he talked about last week. Kathy over in uh, Western Massachusetts. Ruff. Kathy Ruff, yeah. I was l looking for her name on here. All right, anybody got any comments from the board? Yeah, I do. Go ahead. Um, is there a possibility we could postpone this for a week and find out a little bit about this lady? I mean, I could consider myself a consultant if I wanted to, and, and you know, we don't know anything about her. The only thing we know is that she is helping other counties. Well, and a similar similar thing. Thing. That's other towns to do similar things. Yeah. I, I tend to agree that it'd be nice to know a little bit more about her background. Any other comments? I mean, you know, it's only a couple hundred bucks, not like it's a, you know, thousands of dollars. True. But I guess the question is how many times will she be coming and how many yeah. times This is just this one time to get some more understanding of, of what she can offer. Um, help us with, you know, listening sessions, help us um, samples of the RFP. Um, well, do I hear a motion to... Uh, is the county food system doable with or without the farm? Um, There a motion to uh, either approve or table or... Also another thing he, he said, there was a Charlene Anderson with the New Hampshire um, a CLF, I forget what that was, but it was like, a, uh, it was like another um, loan funding uh, agency uh, who would like to partner with, with her. Uh, on on the feasibility study, Charlene Anderson with NHCLF is interested in working with her on this. Right. So that might be another uh, source of you know funding for the feasibility study as well. What's the uh, recommendation from the board? I heard one that wanted to put it off until next week. To find out a little bit more information on it. Anything else? So the, the objective is is that we need to put together an RFP in order to obtain the funding from other sources. Right, and to see if anyone's interested in in even doing this.
and, and, and we have to decide what we want to do with the land. I mean, you know, what do we want to do with it? I, I don't think a food hub is, 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 what, what, is what's going to happen down here. Because from what Steve's finding out, all, you know, all the areas that, that they tried this, it doesn't work because the farmers don't want to, you know, sell full stem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, she's got, as mentioned up above, uh, she has two questions. Can the county farm operate profitably as a standalone? Is a county food system doable with or without the farm? She thinks that, that, that we can make it more profitable by utilizing the way it's, it's going, but we can make it a little more, a little more profitable. I, I tend to agree with that, but a lot of things have got to be done. So I think that's why Steve wants her to come to talk to the rest of the group to kind of get mm -hmm. you know, a consensus of where we want to go with this. Mm -hmm. The 22nd is next week. Right. right. And yeah, it's next, next Thursday. Next Thursday. And next Wednesday we kinda late to approve. Yeah. I will make a motion that we uh that we uh, give her the two hundred to three hundred dollars to come for that day. You know, for discussion purposes. I'll second. Discussion, go ahead. Um Ordinarily, I would vote no, but uh, Steve has worked so hard on this project and yeah. he's hustled, and and this would be just another uh, bump in the road if we ha if he has to wait another week to find somebody in for two hundred and fifty or three hundred dollars if we get any information out of her good, and if we don't, um, well, we haven't lost the whole farm. And I think in deference to his efforts that we should support it. I agree hundred percent. He has done a fantastic job, not given an awful lot of information from us mm. as to what to look at. He's taken it on. He's reported to us on a number of occasions. Uh, he's doing an excellent job. Any comments? Chris? I would like to add in this discussion whether if we vote to do this, that he make an effort to, to get a uh, resume from her or something and get it emailed to us before next week. But it's not a showstopper. If it doesn't okay. work. But if he can, I'd like to see it. Yeah. Anybody else got any questions? Well, I'm just... I guess... I have some reluctance, um, you know, spending the money um, toward it, uh, mainly because I was under the impression before that, you know, we were putting together a community of volunteers and, you know, that the funding would be accessible um, through other sources. So I'm apprehensive because. I'm not sure that this one meeting is really the end of it. Like there'll be have to be more meetings, and she's going to come for listening sessions, and she's, you know, and, you know, and those sort of things. So those those are things that that I'm concerned about because that's my understanding was that we could get a grant and that would cover the feasibility study. I mean, this is if this is the only money we're putting in to open the door for all of that. That's one thing. But if this is only the beginning of the flow of money, yeah. well, I think you, you you can make it that this is it. After this, this is this is it. Yeah. So one time, I mean, I, I agree. I don't think it should be. I don't, I don't think it should be continuing. You know, I mean, maybe we could formulate it that formulate that we're willing to, you know, put up this three hundred dollars as seed money so they can use that so they can get it together so they can mm -hmm. find put together an RFP to have someone who would come I mean we did do that with the jail the seed money there was $30,000 to get that all 
get, to get that put together. Of course, that was a lot larger project, but um, so that is my concern. My, my concern is that this is just the beginning of many 200 to $300 bills, yeah. or a number of them, you know, half a dozen to a dozen of them, as opposed to this is just what we need to get started, help us so we can get an RFP, so it does get distributed, so then we can go from there and have the funding set in place. I think we should do this, and I also think that because we do this, it shows to the Peter Bensons and uh, the other gentlemen that we are very interested in doing this. Mm. We would put this up, but hopefully they would pick up more in the future. Um, it shows that we are very much interested in this, and and uh, that hopefully they would pick up some of the costs later on. Okay? Well, my motion, I, yep, I agree with Chris. My motion is uh, the 250 to $300 for the September 22nd meeting only. So it doesn't go on. I don't want to, I don't want to get this well. Maybe uh, in our next meeting I can find this information for you and it's another $300. Either she's working here or she's not working here. That's why I called it a job interview when I started. If she's going to come and show us what she can do and then and then bid on doing the job, that's one thing. But she's not going to come down here and, and every week and, and collect a, a fee, as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. But I, I want to support um, Steve Knox for the job he's done. I would second what you just said. So, any further questions? And we have it, you can find it somewhere. Yep. All those in support of the motion say aye. 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 So it's unanimous. One time. So approved. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank Steve Knox. You're right, he's doing a great job on this. He's talked to more people than I, yep. I could even imagine. <clears throat> Absolutely. Um, I think I'm going to save the no smoking policy uh, till next week. We did find out Health Trust is willing to help us uh, to help some of the staff members. Also, EAP has uh, a willingness to help as far as um, people can call and you know and get uh, they can get re our referrals to places that, that will help them with, you know, smoking. Um, I, I'm assuming you're going to hold the uh, communications we got from two different people. No, I'm going to bring those up, though. Huh? I said I, I, I'm going to, I, I'm going to talk about that. You do or you don't? I am going to talk about it, okay. yes. Okay. Um, and in doing that with the no smoking policy, uh, we, we received two letters, or and a letter and an email, uh, one from uh, 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 Melissa Siemens. Uh, this came in on uh, September 14th. Uh, I'd like to read it to you. Uh, Dear Commissioners, the, the discussion about and adoption of the no smoking policy is one of the most ridiculous things I have seen come out of the county in a long time. And in 20 years I have seen mounds of ridiculousness. I didn't even know that was a word. Why in the world is the county administration so adamant about adopting yet another policy for a problem that doesn't exist? If cigarette butts are being thrown on the ground, put out an ashtray. If an employee has an offensive odor emanating from their body for whatever reason, smoking, uncontrollable, flatulence, body odor, they stepped in dog crap, etc., 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 can't they be, just be counseled? privately by their manager, and asked to freshen up. How many complaints have you actually received from nursing home residents about staff smelling like smoke? Employees go to smoking areas. They're not standing at entrances to buildings and blowing smoke in people's faces. To presume, to presume that a small percentage of employees who smoke needs help or wants to quit smoking is arrogant and overbearing. 
Who are you to dictate the personal lifestyle choices that people make? Do they come to work to do their jobs? That is all county administration should be concerned about. What is next? Stopping the sale of soda, banning employees from eating fatty foods, requiring employees to exercise on their lunch break. Where does it end? Please worry about real issues. This isn't one of them. Sincerely, Melissa Siemens, a.k.a. the only county employee that wasn't invited to Employee Appreciation Day. Two. This came, in this, uh, this came in yesterday, this came in last night, about 10.13, and it's from uh, Deanna Chaffee. Uh, she's a LNA and the president of the SEA union. Ah, uh, SEA. Um, but she's not writing this as a union. No. Uh, so it says to the commissioners, this is more for David Babson and Chris as you seem like the two more logical ones as I go on the government oversight. My head hurts after listening to David Sorensen as he makes no sense. The questions he asks just don't even make sense. So how he can vote on anything that he doesn't even understand is beyond me. But a couple of questions I do have, one in regards to the smoking policy. One of the issues is the smell. Do you think people aren't going to smoke on their, way, on their ways to work or even if someone is a non-smoker and lives with a smoker, their clothes could still smell like smoke. And in case you don't know, at the nursing home, the staff works very short staff very often, no matter what management might tell you, and a lot of the staff that come in on their days off to cover shifts from call-outs or stay on to the next shift to cover for call-outs, a lot of these staff are smokers. And if they didn't stay to help out, then on several occasions, there would be units with no staff that would be awesome. But you banned, banned smoking, and these staff may not be so willing to give up their time to help. And I don't drink coffee, and I hate the smell of coffee breath, so should we ban coffee drinking on the county complex? Maybe you should investigate on your own and talk to staff about staffing levels and stop listening so much to Ken. And another question I have is, why is the county administrator not a voted position instead of a hired position? Ken doesn't even pay taxes to Carroll County, so what gives him the right to say what happens on county property? And maybe someone should let him know all the times he refers to it as our land. Until he pays taxes in Carroll County, it is not his land. Thank you for your time, Deanna Chafee. I guess we'll take those two letters uh, under advisement. We do have, I hope that we do get some documentation. <clears throat> My understanding that there were a couple or several, I'm not sure how many, but at least there was uh, some people in the nursing home as residents there were or did complain about uh, smoking and uh, having to put up with whoever's helping them or assisting them reek uh, with their clothes. Uh, did I hear that correctly? I, I had staff members tell me, non-smokers tell me, yes. Okay. Yeah. So it wasn't residents, it was staff members? Right. Okay. Non-smokers come mm -hmm. out and tell me to thank me for, for your, your, your willingness to do this. Okay. Okay. Any um, comments from the board regarding letters? Well, the last one, <coughs> my opinion, um, if you don't like the policy, that's fine, but a letter like this is rude and there's no excuse for it. And the other one, um, she may not think there's a problem, but I do. And I think we should address it, and we have. Very well said. <coughs> um, well, I think that um, in regards to the no smoking policy, I, I think we need to 
make sure that it's well thought out and well planned and we do take into account the people who do smoke and their feelings and offer them reason, reasonable alternatives and a reasonable transition period so it goes smoothly for them. And you know, and I think that's what's important. I still have an open mind about you know what the final result will be um, of how I would vote on it. But I think that there are some points for those folks who do smoke. Um, and I certainly would like to see um, some policies written by other um, nursing homes that we could get our hands on, you know, because of public information uh, or hospitals, and to try to find ways to make it more smooth. Um, because, you know, cigarettes are highly addictive. So I can understand, and I can understand. Well, I used to smoke. It was a long time ago. Thank God I can hardly remember it. It must have been 30 years, 28 years ago. But, but it wasn't easy. And, um, you know, I know a lot of people who've tried and tried and tried and can't. So it is maybe a daunting task and put it in front of them. So you still support the basic concept or not? Yes, I support the, okay. the concept of the policy, yes. Okay. But I think we still need to, in the formulation of that policy, really take into account the peoples who struggle with it. You know, um, I think it may take maybe a special set of disciplinary action as opposed to the regular disciplinary action that's in our handbook. You know, maybe it's something that's different. Um, or maybe the transition period is a little longer, or maybe we allow them to use the, the vape cigarette type things for a while, since they seem to produce less odor um, as part of the transition. Just those types of thoughts um, to help that part of it, because I think it is going to take people a long time, and I do understand why there is plenty of pushback because, like I said before, I don't, I don't know anyone who quit smoking that ever regretted stopping. And I, I'm not sure of many people who ever started smoking that were glad they did. So, you know, I think our ideas are in the right place, but, you know, we have to take into account both sides of what's going on. But so far, I mean, we've been talking about this for about a month now, and the only pushback has been two people. I was both mm -hmm. Really? So, so I mean that's that's my input. That I think that part of it, the important, an important piece of it, is that transition time and what we can do and what we offer as alternatives to smoking that will still keep, you know, satisfy their nicotine addiction, mm -hmm. you know, or the the oral addiction, you know, that that part of it too. Um, and we can't keep people, we can't make people stop smoking. No. That's for sure. There are some truisms to what they said. There are certain things we can't do. But, so that, that's, as I said, that's my input, is just trying to make it easier on the folks who have a really hard time with it, and that, you know, maybe we should have a more forgiving ear to if they do have some violations, you know, the first. And, 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 and I just want to make a comment on, on the last part of that letter, it doesn't matter if I live in this county or not. You know, half, half the employees don't live in this county. Um, it, you know, I still do my job the way I'm supposed to do it, and I take direction from you. Mm -hmm. And if you tell me that this is my job, it's my job. If and you move to the county, do you expect a pay raise? <laughs> no, I should, I, I should get a pay house. decrease. Because <laughs> my taxes would be lower up here than it would be down in Stratford County. That's, that's a good point. So you would pay me less. Okay. That's a good point. John, did you have your hand up for a public comment regarding smoking? No, but I'd be glad to speak on it. Oh, I Please. thought you did. Okay. Um, no, wait a minute. Go ahead, John. Oh, is he going to say something? I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, 
all too often you hear about internal policies and so forth in order to uh, put controls on employees. Uh, it would be in my imagination that you propose to be slave masters, okay? But on the employee side of the spectrum, that's what you look like. You know, where are our freedoms going here? I understand that some people have a, a problem with the, the smell. I used to smoke. And now that I go to visit somebody that might smoke in their house and leave, only to find my own clothes saturated with a stench. But I'm not, you know, opposed to them smoking. That's a choice. And it's like if you remove one of my choices in life, personal choices, are you infringing on your own by making these policies? I guess. Go ahead. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it could be something else besides smoking. Yeah. All right. Uh, I don't think it's fair to put personal controls on people just because they're employed. Mm -mm. Not at all. Uh, I think that the smoking function in, in society has diminished a great deal over the last 20 years. Less people smoke, and I think it's just going to go away eventually because it is unhealthy. You know, but I don't really think that you need to react in such a way that you have a smoking epidemic. You don't. Mm -hmm. So to try to attack something that way as though you were expecting an ex epidemic in that sense, I think is wrong. Okay, thank uh, you for your comment. It's very overbearing, okay, and if I were an employee, I'd be a little upset with my employer that they think so much of themselves to dictate a person's personal life or choices. I guess, my, let me make a comment first. Um, my comment is that I'm not overly concerned about employees. I'm more concerned about our residents that are stuck in bed that have no recourse. Um, if they don't like smell, are they supposed to go to another nursing home? Um, who represents them uh, when it comes to they don't like smell and they are our residents? Um, that's where I'm coming from, looking at the resident portion versus the employee. Well, if you go back 20, 30 years, the way of life to such a degree that, uh, you know, everybody spoke publicly, everywhere they went, restaurants, stores, you name it. Yeah. And, you know, to want immediate change, I think, is not the answer because, you know, you're kind of imprisoning somebody because they smoke. No, but you get my... I know what you're saying, but saying. I mean, it's always been a way of life. <clears throat> I mean, why all of a sudden does everybody complain? Why, because the rest of the country made it an issue? No, 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 no. I'm talking strictly about our residents that are stuck in bed. I, and I have to put up with it. I understand that. But this is a, you know, nationwide, if not international, problem. <clears throat> Everybody's complaining about the thing. It's always been there. Okay. You've always encountered these people. And they're not bad, they're not bad people. Okay. Why should they be punished? Okay. Thank you for your input, Thank you. Mr. Bassett. No, you expressed my my thoughts to a T. Okay. In your packet, you have a uh, an updated letter from the Hampshire Retirement System. Our employer contribution rates are going up. Uh, beginning July first, twenty seventeen. Kenny, am I reading this correctly? Um, total employer percentage. We contribute in Group Two. Twenty-nine percent. Currently, right now, it's twenty-five point three three. Yeah, it's going to go up to twenty-nine point four three. But. So if if they're making a hundred dollars a week, we're paying twenty five dollars and thirty three cents. Right. And it's going to go to twenty twenty nine forty three. Mm -hmm. Is there any way to to uh, calculate on another sheet of paper for next week um, what the total damage is? It's pretty substantial. Uh, well, it's another, you know, it's it's another four percent, which 
we have no control over. Right. So I'd like to see if we could get Chuck to just whip up a sheet that shows what 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 the damage what the was this is. year and what it's going to be next year because when it comes time to budget, we got to convince somebody that we don't have any say in the situation. Well, we're right here. I just give him this letter. Yeah, but it doesn't tell you. It doesn't tell you. What it's going to cost us. What it's going to cost us. We just go along. Okay, yeah, all right. And group two, is that include the sheriff and the jail? Yes. Well, the sheriff, um, group two. most are retired, yeah. So I'm not sure if they're putting in. If they were, if they're full-time in, yes, they have to. But if they're retired yeah. and only working 32 hours, then no, they would not be. But it it is the jail and the sheriff the jail, mostly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Also, this week we received a 91A request from Ed Como. That's in your packet. It's a three-page request uh, for information on the dental and health insurance claims. I uh, forwarded off to Liz Bailey uh, for their review. I believe some of it is HIPAA-related information. So she's looking at that, and we'll get back to us on... Why don't you read it? Okay. So put it down the record so, so public knows. People, people realize what Mr. Right, from the law was. office of Martin and Hippo. I represent Ed Como. On whose behalf I make this request, please direct all communication regarding this matter to my office. As a preliminary matter, I will point out that Carroll County may not rely on HIPAA to avoid its obligations under RSA 91A. This is because HIPAA only applies to covered entities and the county is not a covered entity. Indeed, there are no federal statutes generally prohibiting the release of medical records by an employer. And he gives the, um, the Harris versus Descom and blah, blah, blah. Uh, the privacy rule of HIPAA does not directly regulate employers or other health plan sponsors that are not, that are not covered by HIPAA. This is because HIPAA provides that standards concerning the handling of health information shall apply to a health plan, a health care clearinghouse, or a health care provider who transmits any health information in electronic form in connection with a transaction referred to in section 132OD-2A1 of this title, Beard versus City of Chicago. As the county is not a health plan, health care clearinghouse, or a health care provider, I, don't know, I would consider the nursing home a health care provider, but mm -hmm. as divided in the HIPAA statute and companion regulations, the county is not a covered entity in the HIPAA, and its records are therefore not covered by HIPAA's privacy rule. Uh, if you believe that, that any authority requires or justifies non-disclosure of any particular piece of information, you are required to make at least a partial disclosure, redacting only the parts of the records that are protected from disclosure while disclosing the rest, Large versus Knowlton. Uh, for all redactions and or withheld documents, please prepare a Vaughn index describing the document and redacted information and the precise reason for the withholding redaction. While I have no objection to all but the last four of each employee's or planned participant's social security number being redacted, the names of such employees and or planned participants must not be redacted as that information is necessary to analyze what benefits were paid to non-eligible individuals on behalf of the county. Furthermore, I request that your answers categorize the produced documents according to the paragraph requesting that document. That way I can determine which request the document satisfies. Please provide me with the following. A. All persons who work for Carroll County in the business office or in a position related to human resources from January 1st, 1998 to December 31st, 2012. That is the period of inquiry. B. All persons mentioned above in A who would have been responsible for ins ensuring the proper upkeep of the county's list and or record of dental insurance beneficiaries at any time during the period of inquiry. C. Any persons not mentioned in B above who would have been responsible for ensuring that the county's dental insurance beneficiaries were currently eligible to receive such benefits at any time during the period of inquiry. D. All written communications including letters, memorandums, emails, text messages, facsimiles, 
and other similar items regarding dental insurance that were sent and or received during the period of inquiry by any person listed in your answers to B and C above. E. All documents and records reviewed by Deborah Newland in order to prepare the memorandum dated October 22, 2015, addressed to Karen Umberger with the subject line, Identified Discrepancies in Dental Invoices. F. All communications sent or received by Deborah Newland and referenced in the memorandum dated October 22, 2015, addressed to Karen Umberger with the subject line, Identified Discrepancies in Dental Invoices. G. All documents related to any dental insurance claim made at any time during the period of inquiry by or on behalf of any person who, at the time of the claim, was dead. H. All documents related to any dental insurance claims made at any time during the period of inquiry by or on behalf of any person who, at the time of the claim, was not employed by the county. I. All documents related to any dental insurance claims made at any time during the period of inquiry by or on behalf of any person who, at the time of the claim, was employed by the county but otherwise ineligible to remain on the dental plan. J. All payments, receipts, checks, or other related documentation for any payments made by the county or the dental insurance company related to any claims described in G, H, and or I. K. For all persons who were employed by the county at any time during the period of inquiry, please provide me with all employment records related to the dates of their employment, any changes in employment status, including terminations and eligibility for dental or health insurance through the county. L. For all persons included in your answers to K above, please provide me with all records showing the providing of and or payment for dental insurance premiums or co-payments and any claims made on that dental insurance during the period of inquiry. Please reply within the statutory deadlines of New Hampshire RSA 91A if you believe that any of the requested information or documentation is exempted pursuant to New Hampshire RSA 91A, please state exactly what is exempted and the statutory section under which exemption is allowed. Best regards, Seth J. Ippel, Esquire, C.C. Ed Como. Um, so you have sent this to our attorney? To yes. And have you... Um, Sent anything back to uh, Attorney Hipple saying no. that we're looking into it? No. Do we have a certain time period? Liz right? Bailey is, is, is going to let me know on, on all of this. In five days. Yeah, we have five days. Okay. So I have till next Tuesday. Okay, go ahead. Um, I can't imagine that Mr. Como, Representative Como, the next one. And, and all the time that he spent here videotaping our meeting doesn't understand that this is going to take an ungodly amount of time. That some of our records are here, some of our records are in the nursing home, they're not filed in the nursing home, they're in boxes that have to go through. He's within his right to ask for this information, but it's going to be time consuming and costly and I would suggest that we um, we send an email to uh, Representative Umberger and either uh, uh, get her feelings on where she wants us to transfer the money out of, what line item. So, so, uh, so, some unfortunate department head who's doing a good job won't get what they wanted to get this year, and find out where we we're not going to have the money to pay for this um, uh, when we're done. So, unless, unless. Uh, unless it goes it goes to court, we're not going to uh, be able to afford it. But unless we get a legal opinion that this does fall under Hitler, I don't see how we're going to escape it without costing us thousands of dollars. Comment, Chris? Um, well, we sent it on to our attorney, and they're going to and they are going to respond to. She's going to call me this afternoon on the face value. They, they have uh, HIPAA experts in-house that, that are going to review this uh, and let us know what, what we need to do, at, what the next step would be. Okay, but as far you know, as HIPAA is concerned. Right, and as far as responding to the right to know. Okay. They will keep us up to date. Okay. So, 
Because this is going to take a long. Yeah, it's going to take some time. I, I agree with uh, the commissioner um, that Commissioner this, Babson. Yes, I do agree with the commissioner Babson that this does appear to be quite costly. I mean, quite a lot of information that they're requesting and information that may not be easy to obtain and copy. So, but I believe that, well, I'd be interested to find out what reasonable charges, fees that we could charge for making all these copies and finding all this, finding all this information and making it available. Um, you know, that would be also a component of of this because it is quite costly. I mean, to do this, I mean, there must be some sort of remedy for the county for, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, requests that are not easily obtainable. Obtainable. Go ahead, Commissioner. I was just going to say, Crystal. My next comment was, you know, we're going to have to get all of this stuff up. That's costly. We we can't charge for that, but. It's going to be reams and reams and reams of paperwork, which Chris just pointed out, and it's going to be photocopied. And I mean, if if, if Ed and Mr. Hippel think they're going to get out of this for for nothing, they're wrong. It's going to cost to be a very expensive undertaking for him too, rather than and including down time consuming. No, that. But I have to have a staff member who's going to have to, you know, he's going to have to look for all this stuff. Yeah. yeah. But we'll do what we have to do. I would definitely um, recommend that we send a letter to Hippo saying we've received this request and we're looking into it or something to that effect so that we meet that five day deadline so we don't have that. Uh, don't worry, I, I, won't, I won't miss that. Okay. Okay. Next. Um, well, we're scheduled to go into non-public now, but I guess we can uh, push it off another 10, 15 minutes. Um, I did want to mention that uh, the resident breakfast has been changed. It is not the 21st, it's on the 28th. So it's been moved to the 28th. Okay. Trouble catching the pigs? I don't know. I just got a call from, uh, <laughs> I just got a call from Chris this morning. Chickens on the move? Uh, and our our basket for the Association of Counties uh, is complete. Uh, Cheryl has been doing a great job uh, putting it all together and uh, calling a bunch of people. The value is at seven hundred dollars. Yeah, I you know I would suggest that they have a, a raffle where people buy tickets. I don't know what the process is, so I probably shouldn't talk, but that's a lot of value in just our basket. Is there going to be ten of them? Um, there's a place where maybe the association can derive a little income from it. Maybe it's not permissible. So I, I don't know. I just raising the question, I guess. But, you know, I mean, you know, I know all of you you got something for the basket. Um, you all made calls, so and Cheryl made a, a ton of calls too. Yes. Thank you, Cheryl. Oh, yeah. Um, to that comment you just made, a lot of the people that we contacted asked if this was going to be raffled off oh. for money or whether it was just like a door prize. They're much more willing to donate if it's a door prize. Door prize. Yeah. Okay. Just so you know. Good Good feedback. Feedback. Thank you for putting all that together. Yeah. yeah. You, you did, did a good a job. Perfect job. Yep. Yeah. The, I, so, on the September 28th resident breakfast, does that mean the meeting will start at 9 instead of 8.30? On, on the 28th. On the 28th. Yeah. Yes. So I just wanted Good to point. remind people that... 9 a.m. on the 28th. Uh, and next week's the Association of Counties Convention. Uh, I'll be going Thursday, Friday. Where I'm going. I'm not going Wednesday. We'll have our meeting. No, I'm not going Wednesday. Yeah. Um, I have the, uh, well, we can do the review of non-public minutes for March in the non-public session. The employee appreciation parties today starts at uh, 11 o'clock.
and that's going to be a, I mean, we did a great job uh, getting together, you know, uh, raffle prizes. Uh, how was the guys that, did a great job. How was that advertised to the campus? Cheryl? Um, there was a, f a flyer that went out um, from HR, mm -hmm. and um, Carrie put it in all the envelopes of all the employees. Oh, good. And it, and it was printed on the checks themselves, yes. in, in the in the note space. Okay. It's been put on the on the bulletin boards and the entrance to the nursing home. It's on there. Mm -hmm. uh, there's two big tents out back. People have seen the tents, so they all know what's going on. Good. Yeah. So it's you know it's just a great way to show appreciation to our to our staff. I think we'll have to do a special one though for uh, you know for dietary. Because they're the ones that are doing all, a lot of the work, yeah. you know. Um, so Chris has done a great job with this. Uh, so the pig has been cooking. Yes, as it's all speak. set. He's ready to go. Good. Uh, if you want to go into non-public, because we have to be over there by eleven. Okay. Oh, um, remember we have to recess the meeting now, because we have to take it back up at 1 o'clock. Okay. I'll make a motion that we go into non-public um, session. Uh, session 1 is 91A, A3, paragraph 2C. Um, session 2 is a non-meeting uh, non strategy and negotiation with respect for collective bargaining. Um, and session three and four, uh, paragraph A3, uh, RSA 91A3, paragraph 2A, um, dismissal and promotion and compensation of any public employee or the discipline and disciplining of any such employee or the investigation of any charges against him unless the employee affected. One has the right to a meeting, and two request the meeting be open. In which case, the request shall be granted. Second, roll call. Are we going to have commissioners' updates? Um, when we come back, I guess we, we could do it at one o'clock. Yeah, we're at one o'clock. Do it one o'clock if we want. I just wasn't sure if we were kind of coming back in the public for the commissioner's updates. We'll come back. We'll, we'll come back for, I guess, one of the um, 91A right. requests at 1 o'clock. We have to come back at 1 for that non-public. Okay. So you're going to have to break the meeting, recess it, and reconvene again at 1 o'clock. Right. Go back into non or Are we still in non-public then? We could be. Yeah, we're probably still non-public. So we'll just recess until 1, we'll go back into non-public, because we never came out of it. Mm -hmm. And then we'll come, and out then of, after that hearing, we'll come back into public, yeah. seal the yeah. minutes if we got to do, then you can do your, your updates, if you guys got any. Yeah. Do you have updates? Just a okay. Okay. small ones. Okay. Or you, we can do it now, whatever you want to do. <coughs> well, I got a motion on the floor. Yep, go okay. ahead. Commissioner Ogle. Yes. Commissioner Sorensen. Yes. Commissioner Babson. Yes. Okay, John, we will be coming back at 1 o'clock for non-public, and we'll be coming out of non-public into public for commissioner updates um, and whatever else. So then we'll have to seal the minutes. Yeah. Okay, we're non-public. It's about eight minutes to uh, three. Uh, we just came out of non-public session, and we sealed the minutes. Um, so we're now in public session. And Ken, um, would you, on behalf of the board of directors, write a letter to Chris saying thanking him for the um, uh, friend. hospitality <laughs> or uh, yeah. fixing and staff. that? Absolutely. That uh, what do you want to say? What was it? It was a great staff appreciation party. Appreciation for all the staff. Party. 
Um, they really enjoyed themselves. The food was excellent. Entertainment, hey, raffles, good, atten good attendance. Yep. Great day. Yep. Weather wise, we'd like to thank a lot of change. That but we'd like to thank Commissioner Babson for the uh, fine weather. <laughs> well, it was my idea to have this on no, this true, day. Too. So the letter goes to Chris and the uh, dietary staff. Department. Yes, sir. We'd be glad to do that. The point of my real statement really is. Whenever you get something planned for the whole day like this, right. it's a bright sunny day, so you can't go make hay. It's never a rainy day, so you can. Uh, but I guess wherever else you might deem appropriate to address the letter too, because I mean there seemed to be a real team effort over there about certain exactly. people. Exactly. did a exactly. great job. Yeah. Right. And also Carrie from you know exactly. from right. public right. payroll did a great job. Um, yeah. Yeah. Put you together know. the raffle prizes. Yep. And, you know, yep. the, the donations and the band itself donated. So oh, yeah, the band was great, too. Okay. Did they donate their time? Uh, yes. Yeah. Good for them. Well, half of it did. Next year, okay. can you need to provide a dance floor? Yes, a dance floor? Okay. <laughs> no, I don't want to talk in an afternoon. And will you provide anything else? Degrees. You won't You won't be a commissioner. I won't be a commissioner. But you can still give us a donation of some blueberry wine. I'll bring you any I, um, I, have a, I have a funding transfer request number four. Um, you'll see that uh, uh, I need to transfer $175 uh, from my dues li licenses and subscription to the SRF sewer system uh, for, for interest. Um, we didn't calculate it properly, oh, so we're $175 short. And that will take us through the end of the year? Yes, we have to, we're all done. Um, we, we all make two payments on that. Right, okay. What is, what is the two SRF on the on the sewer system? Huh? What's the SRF sewer system? It's, it's a loan. loan payment. It's, it's a loan payment. It's a loan to redo the water, the pipes in the water system. Yeah, it's a bond payment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. from, from years ago? Yes. Yeah. Just, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's not much left. No, it's not a very big note left. What I saw. Oh, it isn't. Uh, another thing I have from Hale's location. I need your signature on the MS one. The inventory evaluations. Let me look on it's is that, where, is where the signatures are. Well, that's probably just just the commission. Yeah, uh, it's, it's a head man. It's just the head man, isn't it? No. No, it's no, it's all three of you. When everybody, when we have hails, everybody signs. Okay, Thank you, sir. I'm not going to be responsible for it. I'm learning as I'm leaving. Enough of that. Just in the register in the register of deeds this month, uh, the month of August, uh, it was eighty four thousand five hundred and twelve dollars uh, for her income. It's the largest uh, month so far. And if you look across. From other Augusts in the past, this is the highest August she's ever had. Oh, no. in the uh, from uh, 07. 2007, it was 92,000. 2007? Yeah, if you go across, but since 2000, it's the biggest. Since oh, whoops, sorry. Yeah, I, I was down one. But that's still good. Yep. Yeah, and it's significantly yes. higher than. Yep. Any other year except you know one was. Oh, well, it's down nine. two years, right? So it's I wish this chart would show on it what we estimated for revenue for the 
entire year. Can you find it quickly in your shirt? Yeah. yeah, I got it right, right there. there. It's um, 327,000. Uh, well, that's, no, for the, uh, that's recording fee. Transfer tax? The whole, the whole, whatever she's. 765,000. 165,197. And that figure relates to uh, the uh, figure we have through 2016. So our goal is 755,000. We're at 5,022. Yeah, we're, uh, we've got two, or we're about, uh, we're about 67 percent, so we're, we're right about where we should be. And it, is, and it should be good the rest of the year. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the past months, I mean, you know, September should be a big month for us. Mm -hmm. So hopefully it'll, it'll be larger than, 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 than August. If we have another good month like we did last year in October, uh, November, and then another big one in December, we should be well over. Yeah. Well over. I mean, yeah, I mean, if you just look at two, two, just uh, the five, average five, so far, five, you extrapolate that out, it puts us at about seven hundred eighty-three, well, eight, seven hundred eighty-four thousand instead of seven sixty-five. Seven sixty-five. But that doesn't take into account like any cyclical stuff to it. I mean, if we like last year, we did very well at the end of the year, the very end of the year, mm -hmm. you know. But it kind of balanced out. But it seems like we're on track. We should we should uh, we should come out winners by about if at this pace for the dividing the time for what we have now by eight we should come out about fifty grand ahead of our uh, estimates. And if you look at your your revenue guideline really quick, um, the jail is just exploded exploded with uh, with borders. Uh, yeah, but we do have. We're one hundred sixty-six thousand uh, dollars, one hundred sixty-six percent over where where we should be. But well, we do have some meal costs, right? Yeah, uniform costs too. But still, I mean, still look at it. Uh, we're one hundred twenty-four percent over. Um, yeah. On the, on the whole revenue. And if you look at borders, we're 166 percent. So we're doing very well over there, very well. And that's through July 31st. And uh, but that doesn't show us. This doesn't show us. We don't have any line items for how much it's cost us for. Uh, for uh, clothing and uh, and meals. No, you have to go into the expenses. Well, I say it doesn't that. show there. It doesn't. Maybe we ought to think about having a line item for at least meals for boarders because we can keep track of that. We can't keep track of how many shirts they wear. I can give you a next week. We can extrapolate it out and and I can give you a count. <laughs> Love those words. <laughs> Oh, thank you, sir. <laughs> oh, I think it's not important. I'm just saying that this, it looks like 166000 but when you figure in some of the costs, it's, it's going to be good, but it isn't going to be as good as it was. Well, we have 63000 left for meals. Better than it was last from year. Well, August 31st. Yeah, we're, we're going to be, uh, we're, we're going to be transferring some money at some point, probably in, in late, late November. Um, I'm a little worried about in the expenses in the in the DPW uh, some of the page is that on? Oh, that's on that's the one right before the uh, the jail. It's got a page? Yeah, hold on. Oh yeah. Uh, eight. 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 Page eight. And what are you worried about? I'm worried about uh, the 
uh, equipment repair. It's at 95%. We got $248 left. Um, and I'm worried about I guess that was it. Um, so that's so. I'm gonna meet with Will, and um, we're gonna look at maybe transferring some money around somewhere. We've been having uh, last last week when he or two weeks ago when he replaced the water spigot out here by the garden. Uh, we, we noticed a big drop in the uh, wells. Uh, so after he re replaced it. Yeah. Yeah, all, all three pumps came on. Uh, it took over the weekend for it, to, for it to fill back up. So he's been monitoring it. Since then, it's kicked off the one pump again. Um, and he's been monitoring the, uh, the chlorine levels. Um, the chlorine level has been, it's been pumping a little more chlorine in there for some reason. So he's doing a test to, uh, tomorrow and bring it down to concrete for, uh, for an analysis to make sure that everything's, you know, really kosher. Why would, if we fix the valve and stop the leak, why... That's what was, the, that's what the problem the, why was. Why would the well be down? I don't know. So, he monitored it. And, was it uh, down before he fixed it? Huh? Was it down before he fixed it? I don't know. He said when he went back up there, it was way down and three, all three pumps were on, pumping from all three locations. Uh, from all three wells. So he's had um, Mark monitor it on the weekends too, so he'll come in and just check it and make sure you know, it doesn't drop down below if it gets too low. But he said it's the lowest he's ever seen it. Um, so I just want to update on that, that, that you know, we're, we're still monitoring it. Is there, we don't have any other backup for the water supply, no. do we? My concern was if there was a fire in the village, that, 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 that thing would draw it down pretty Rather quickly. And suck the water right out of our buildings. Yeah. Yeah. Out of our boilers. And there goes your tax revenue. So, so he's been talking to the fire chief, and they're going to do the ponds first before they use the hydrants, if they can, um, to you know help help that situation. Do we know if more water was used down uh, the village because uh, of it being so dry? Yeah, he, he said there might that might be it too. You know, people are, are using a little more water. Um, so I thought there might have been a fire, and they used the hydrant, and but there was no fire. I go through there all the time. Don't get water. You know, it's it's the water. sprinkler water. out back. It's the fire station. Mm -hmm. Washing all that. That's probably what it is. All the time. You know? So Bassett over there washing his car. Yeah. Oh, he, he, he ended up washing the duct tape That's right off of it. That's a joke. Uh, that's all I have. Do you have any uh, updates for the commission? Yeah, I do. Go ahead. Well, first, first off, I, I mentioned that we were talking about the, the sewer system, that I mentioned it wasn't very much, meaning that the payment wasn't very much. It's like 50, uh, well, the, the interest is $5,700 uh, for the year, mm -hmm. um, and the principal is 7800 but I did say we don't have much to go because it was so low. That wasn't really, that wasn't really correct. I was, there was another... Yeah. Uh, sewer bond that actually has run out in 2010. So the one, the one that we were speaking of doesn't actually stop. Payment doesn't stop until 2032. I so thought there was one that was up next year. That's but that's the jail. jail. Okay. But th so my memory wasn't quite perfect on that. <laughs> I thought it was almost out, but that may have been the jail. And the one that I thought I saw was actually done in 2010. It's been over. With. Oh, I see. Um, so I just didn't want anybody to be misled by that, that that actually has, it's not a very big payment, as the payments go, mm -hmm. compared to the nursing home, um, but it does have quite a few more years to go. Um, so was that the one that, that they replaced all the pipes? Yeah. Okay. Um, Sorry. No, no worries. And then the other thing was, um, I just wanted to bring up or to remind you that uh, Chuck was going to look into these other forensic audit firms and come back to us with um, an estimate, you know, the, you know, some sort of estimate about what they thought it would cost to do the, the list that we gave to Melanson and Heath so we could get moving, you know, because we were, I, you know, I'm not speaking for the board, but I think we were leaning in the direction of, of, con of sending out an RFP and having the 
a forensic audit firm do it, the list of, that was a, the list that Mark no, was in. I, think I didn't think we'd do a forensic audit. No. Well, not a forensic audit, but has the forensic audit firm tell us what it would cost to do the list. The 12 questions. The 12 yes. questions, because then that way, if they did find something and wanted to move forward, then we wouldn't lose out on that money, which, right. which was kind of the new information that we got during the course of that meeting. Yeah. And that made us lean toward just having someone do it, so if they did find something, we weren't wasting the money on Melanthin and, and Heath to have another firm come but, to do the same work. What money are we going to use? To, to do this, well, they won't have to use that. For unless it's a forensic audit, I'm guessing. Unless well, we, this is the well, first step of doing this, it. This will be the first. Well, step we're just of doing finding it. out. Right? I thought we were going to. We estimated twenty thousand. Chris wanted thirty-five. I thought we were just going to find out what two or three other companies might might charge us on a yep. on a quick scan the of the questions. questions. They the answer yeah, questions. Obviously, we can't hold them to it because. Right, we were trying to get an idea yeah, of the, well, the forensic right. audit firm. Right, you're right, you're right. What right. they would do, yep. how much it would cost, did it make sense to have that firm do it? So, just in case they got them covered with yep. something, yep. that they could then continue with the forensic, a yep. forensic analysis. Whereas, I mean, Lance and Heath would have to stop. It. Right. Okay. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, okay. I'll get them hopping on that. Got anything else? Well, while we're at it... You got anything oh. else? Go ahead. I might have to think about oh. it. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I had my head down. I thought you were asking all of us. Um, regional appropriations. If we're going to do anything about telling uh, these people that they have to do some more fundraising for themselves, if you have any idea what we're going to do on the budget, you know, I think it's only fair to tell those, give those people as much warning as we can that we may not be funding them as high as we well, did. Well, they all the do past. fundraising except for Cooperative Extension, I think. No, the district doesn't. But the, no, district, the district does get money back, I think. I, I don't know about V and A does fundraising, yeah. right? Because they were in talk, talking about it. And. Um, the RSVP does. The, does. And the CAC does, too. Okay. Yeah. What's that one? The, the, the Child Advocacy, oh, yes. Child Advocacy yes. Center? Yeah, yeah they yeah. definitely do. I know. I know. <laughs> Elizabeth does, yeah. <laughs> I know. Um, the district does. They sell, they used to sell trees and stuff, so I don't know if they're still doing that. Yeah, but that's for a certain, pro uh, for a certain... NCR, NC, NRCS. Yeah. So, do so you guys want to talk to them this year, or just level fund them, or what's your idea? Well, Does anybody have any ideas? That's why I was bringing well, it up. Well, they're supposed to request. Yeah. Right. I mean, as the process, we should make sure that they understand they need to get those requests out. You know. But do you have any stipulations? Five percent reduction, level fund, because it's you know. I mean, they count on. Uh, they count on our, uh, our appropriations, and I don't think it's fair to wait till, till March Absolutely 31st not. to say, okay, now we're not going to fund you. We ought to be thinking about what we're going to do. Or we don't have to make a decision today. Do you want to have them come in to talk to you guys about? Do you want to have them come to talk to you about, about their appropriation this year? Because you didn't talk to any last year. I think we should. We're responsible for the budget. They're part of the budget. I think we should get their proposal. Right after we get their proposal, have them come in. Okay. We can review their proposal and uh, yeah. see where they stand. If they're going to be asking last year for it, everybody anymore. was level funded, well, except for CAC. No, CAC was level funded. They were. Everybody was uh, level funded. Nope. Um, Corporate extension went up a couple percent. Corporate extension went up three percent. Uh, so they went up about mm, four thousand, I think. Yeah. And then, uh, not VNA, but the other one, um, RSVP. RSVP went up uh, five thousand. Oh, because of the, mm -hmm. the gas part of it. They had, yeah. they had to start reimbursing more people for right. gas so they get new volunteers. Right. Something like that. So now gas prices are down. We need, need to take it back. <laughs> well, I think they were they weren't <laughs> necessarily giving money to every. I I don't know. But, but I have a vague recollection. But it's good they that they're coming. Good you can ask them all those questions. Yeah. Yeah. 
And since we didn't do it last year, I, I agree we should do it this year. Yeah. Last year was very hectic around the budget time because of the supplemental budget. And Every year it's hectic. Well, I, I think it's, it's more hectic than others. Well, well, some years. You, you said you initiated. Yes, the, everyone, the has the, uh, everyone has all the other budget blanks. They're working on it now. And um, when are they going to be in? When are we going to see the first one? Probably October because we have to close out September. Um, but it, it'll all be done. Um, and then we'll wrap it up by right, right before Thanksgiving. I like to wrap it all up. After. And then give it to the delegation the uh, first week of December first week sometime. Of December, yeah. So sure. hopefully initiate it by the mid October and have it completed by mid November? Yes. It, they already have them, they're, they're working on them now. Well, initiate at least as far as them coming in. Yes. To us. Yep. I, uh, you know, coming yes. to see us. Yes. They, that'll be done. And then in October, they'll come in, we'll go, like we did last year, go through the budget. If they have to make corrections, then they'll make corrections. But I don't see any big things this year. I think look, it's, it's going to be pretty flat. Pretty flat. I mean, you know, we're doing very well uh, financially, ex expense-wise. We're doing very well. Um, you know, our TAN, we're still keeping it low. Well, we have another increase in the BEAS. I'm sure we will. We, we have, have an increase, increase in, in the, our insurance. We have an increase, increase in the retirement in medical. System. We have an increase in our retirement. And some of it we have no control over. Right. The same, yes, yeah, the same stuff that increases every year. There we don't have much control over. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. That sounds good. Just make sure our unions get get their finances it, straightened out. And um, help me, as I recall, we voted to, uh, if they don't get their, uh, you don't get the union thing straightened out by November 1st, uh, their next chance is a year from November. That's what we did. Okay. So they better pay attention to it. I think you better constantly remind them. Well, they'll just send it right, if they're not done, they'll go right to mediation. Anything else? Uh, the Excuse Associated me. Counties is next week, right so don't forget Thursday, Friday. Can I ask a question right there? Yeah. What is the difference between mediation and arbitration? Well, arbitration is binding, and media mediation isn't? Right. That's, a, that's the bottom line. Yeah. Mediation is just trying to find an answer to yep. get you to agree to. Arbitration is a binding decision. So I talked with an arbitrator. And he says it was a learning experience, he was just new at it, <laughs> and that you have to find out what the bottom what the bottom problem is, not just necessarily what's there now, what happened <laughs> before that. Yeah, I don't know if I'd want to be an arbitrator. That's right. Because both parties will a good arbitrator, both parties walk out yeah. feeling like they did you got sure the wrong deal. Fair about it, that's for sure. I mean, we've had some good ones. Um, but. Anything else? No, not that I can think of. Oh, I'm going to start. I'm going to start scheduling our our uh, our, our selectmen meetings uh, coming up soon. So yeah. I think I'm going to hit OSPE first. Because it's right here, and then we'll work our way around again, like we did last year. At least until the end of December. I think we ought to come up with topics that we would brief them on and then let them ask questions. We ought to have something, a presentation. Uh -huh. either, either where we are in our budget, or any projects that we're completing, or sure. involved in. Uh, just a little brief report. To them, okay. and then let them ask questions. Uh, we have a new county vehicle. Uh, the sheriff gave us his 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 older vehicle. It's three years old, uh, four years old. It's smaller, uh, so it uses less gas. It's newer. Got a GPS? No. We're in trouble. <laughs> I'll bring the phone. Um, 
That's great. So we didn't really get a new car. We just got a different car. Right. It's newer. It, well, it's, it's newer to us. It's newer to us. So is the is the other one being decommissioned? Or yes, and going up. Yes, and our our old county car is going up for auction along with the other old sheriff's vehicles. Okay. So we've kind of upgraded. No, it makes sense. I think it's going to get better gas mileage. Yeah. It's in good shape, and why not? Yeah, we saved a lot of money this year on on travel using that county car. That's a good idea. Oh, yeah, I really had a good idea. Thank you. <laughs> um, I heard a rumor of that jail would be looking at leasing a vehicle. I don't support that. I'd rather see us continue using the sheriff's cars. Okay. So before that comes up, that's where I stand. Okay. I don't what think we need any vehicle more vehicles, for? just to replace the vehicles that they have. And right now they have three, my understanding is. Uh, I know of two. Yeah, maybe three. One's a beige one, yeah. They have two white ones and a beige one. Yeah. Three uh, vehicles they get the truck one. and two cars, don't they? No, they, they yeah. have three cars for transports. Yep. I don't think they should get into the lease. They want to get into the leasing like the Sheriff's Department for a brand new vehicle. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, uh, maybe the Sheriff's consider. Department should be considering... The sale of one of those, the sale of one of those vehicles to the jail. Yeah. If they need a vehicle, and we're just and we're decommissioning some vehicles, maybe. That's what the jail's looking for uh, uh, four-wheel drive vehicles, so they can transport in the winter without any issues. How many issues have they had? I there? don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Just yeah, yeah, uh, as I'm saying is, so it's just talk. It's not. They can always ask. Right. <laughs> I'm not going to get into it here <laughs> now, but. There's a, Time for that. Yeah. Do I hear a motion to adjourn? I'll make a motion we adjourn. Second. All those oh, you got public input. Oh. oh, I'm sorry. Public input, John? No. no sorry. Okay, right. I'll continue the motion. I'll make the motion. All those the motion say aye. 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 Are we giving you back everything?